All right, so this is where we left off earlier talking about Vulcan. And I know I'm about to run out of my time here. So the next topic we're going to talk about is mass production. And so here's the thing you need to understand. I want you to write down this phrase if you can hear me. Economies of scale. It may show up here in the lecture. The more you make of something, the cheaper it gets. Okay? So if you come up with a factory plan, factories are made to assimilate all the people and the resources you need in one place so that you can efficiently make large numbers of an item. And when you do that, when you mass produce it, you make the product cheaper. And again, you know, a lot of people have a negative connotation in a factory. A lot of factory jobs are very, very high paying jobs. And so people want to get them. So again, the, the stereotype, the stereotypical conception of a factory is that it's a bad place. And, you know, I wouldn't want to work there either. But they do produce a lot of good things. So, um, all right, so mass production. So Eli Whitney is this American inventor. And uh, this is going to be very important and uh, that you know this on the test. Now, this is he's very important in American history. How important he is in world history, I'm AP world history, I'm not sure. But here's what happened, and I told a couple of my classes this yesterday. Slaves would pick cotton. Not just slaves, but free people as well would pick cotton. And when you pick cotton, you have a big fluff of cotton, but it's not good enough to be turned into thread yet. You have to pull the seeds out, which is horrible work. And I told a couple of my classes, I don't think I told all three of my classes yesterday, that pulling the seeds out, you sit down and you have this mass of cotton and you have to go through with your fingers and pull the seeds out. That is probably harder than picking cotton. Cotton is not heavy, okay? But the thing is, this is hard work and it takes forever. So this guy, Eli Whitney, comes along. Eli Whitney invents this thing called the cotton gin. Okay? And there it is. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. Now, here's what it does. It's a machine... Well, you put in cotton in and you turn this crank and it pulls out the seeds for you. Now, the reason this is so important is there's a couple things I want you to know. First off, what you need to know for this test is that uh, he invented the cotton gin, which makes it easier and cheaper to produce thread to make clothes. Okay, that's the first thing. Here's the other thing he did. Now, this is kind of a big picture thing. He made slavery profitable. Now, you know, I know a lot of you think that these plantation owners were making a lot of money off their slaves, and depending on the product, they were. But there is a theory that the Americans would have eventually freed their slaves because slaves didn't want to be there. So if you gave a slave a shovel and you said, go dig this hole, what that slave did as soon as you weren't looking is he broke the shovel. And you could punish them, but the slaves, is, is if you were there, an overseer with a whip, and you are beating the slave, they're going to work. But the minute you turn around, they're going to goof off. There's even a word for that. It's called malingering. And, and of course, who can blame them? Why would you, you know, why would you want to work if you were a slave? You're not getting paid. And you probably hate your owners and you don't want to do anything for them. So slavery was probably really, really unprofitable. And the United States was probably going to end slavery, not because they were nice people, but simply because it was they weren't making any money at it until they invented the cotton gin. And now what you could do is you could take a an overseer. An overseer is someone who watches slaves, usually carries a whip. Seems like there's another name to it. In the, in, in, in the workplace today, now, of course, we don't have slaves. You would call the boss man the foreman. But you would have this overseer there with the whip or a gun. And so what you could do is you could take 40 slaves and put them in one room with cotton gins and make the slaves do all this. And so this probably almost single-handedly saves slavery, if that makes sense. Now, I know slavery is a horrible topic, but I'm talking about it. I'm, we've talked about the human cost of suffering and all that and how bad the slaves had it. And make no mistake, it was horrible. It was more horrible than anything we could ever imagine, this dehumanizing work. But right now we're going to talk about slavery as if it's just about money, okay? As horrible as that is to do that, we're going to talk about it economically. Slavery, they were probably not making money off slaves. So slavery probably would have ended until the cotton gin comes along. And now sl slavery is profitable. 
And so it probably the invention of this thing probably meant that slavery was not going to end. And it does not end until the American Civil War. Okay? Uh, he did that. Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. And he came up this with this idea that you could use machines to make parts. And so let's say you have a Colt 45 revolver. Back in the day before this, people had you had to hire an engineer to make a gun for you. And the problem is if, if a piece broke, you had to go back to the engineer and get him to build you another piece, right? Specifically for that gun. But if you're a Colt and you make 5,000 Colt 45s, and what you also do is you produce all the different parts. If one piece breaks, you can go get an, another Colt, take the piece out and make this one work. So underline the term interchangeable parts. This is also very advanced. By the way, I'm sitting here. It is uh, 9.52 Monday night after I get back from water polo practice. Um, and uh, we had an old car that uh, I gave to my daughter. It's like a 2005 car. We've had the thing, thing 16 years old. And uh, it's just fallen apart. And we just sold it to a junk dealer. Understand? So this car is a piece of junk. It barely runs. And uh, rather than sell it, we just call the dump. They gave us $400 for it. Can you believe that? A car that barely even runs, it smokes like crazy. But you know what they're doing? We're going to sell it to a junkyard. It is a 2005 Chevy Equinox, which means there's somebody out there probably who has a 2005 Chevy Equinox. And eventually their door handle is going to break. And they don't make this car in this, in this, they still make the Equinox, but they don't make it in this, with this design. So what they're going to do is they could call up this junkyard and the junkyard might sell them that door part for 200 bucks. So they gave us $400 before the junkyard is done. They may make $5,000 off this used car. Why? Because the parts of the cars are interchangeable. So you grew up knowing this. But the first person, so you grew up in this world where you understood about interchangeable parts. But the first person who came up with this is a daggum genius. Uh, and so eventually mass production rapidly became the hallmark of individual societies. You know, back in the day, I keep saying that term back in the day, we didn't have public schools. So if, if, if they had an AP exam 200 years ago, they didn't. You're, only rich people would have taken the exam if there was such a thing. You would have a private tutor, correct? You'd have a private tutor, someone who would come in and spend time with two or three kids at a time. What is Apopka High School? Apopka High School really is a mass production factory to produce high school diplomas. I have 180 students right now. So it's almost like I'm, I'm kind of making a joke. I'm not the only teacher with a lot of kids. We'll take Mr. Mellon. Mr. Mellon's got a ton of AP kids. Mr. Anchow does. Those are, in a sense, those guys are mass producing kids. It's almost like what, what a Popka High School is, is an educational factory. We bring everyone together like a factory. We bust them in. We feed them. We patrol the campus to make sure everybody's safe. We try to keep COVID from getting in here. And we're, and we're an educational factory. And we're trying to produce as many high school graduates that are ready for college as we can. Okay, good example. Henry Ford, extremely famous. Obviously, Ford Motor, Motor Car Company is named after him. He developed the assembly line approach. And I think I told you about this in class yesterday. By the way, Henry Ford, another thing he did that was so genius, I want you to write this down. Because when you get an essay on this, remember, add facts, tell stories. You need to do the same thing in your essays that I'm doing. Tell a story. Because you may get a point for that. And you may get a higher order point, meaning that you are explaining something. So here's what Henry Ford did. Back in the day, oh, where I, there I said it again. <laughs> in olden times, how's that? People would order a car and they'd say, I want green or blue or purple. Henry Ford's objective was to make cars cheap. So he said, you can have any color as you want as long as it's black. Write it down. Every single Ford Model T that rolled off the production line was black. You could hire someone to paint it a different color. He, but in other words, it's expensive to have 50 different colors of paint. He goes, we'll have one. If they want a car bad enough, they'll get one and it'll be black. He completed, I don't know what a chassis is. I don't know if that's the whole thing. or just, I don't even know what that is. And I'm too, it's too late at night for me to go look it up. 
before whatever a chassis is, I thought it was like the, uh, the, the frame or whatever. It used to take 728 minutes to build it. He would, you know, they would make one every 728 minutes. He made one every 93 minutes. And I believe a pic I have a picture coming up. Well, actually, that's a cotton gin. And this is a Ford assembly line. Notice they're black. And you see how long that line goes. This building, if you saw it, this was to be a very straight building. If you look underneath it, you see what looks like a conveyor belt. And so this is an assembly line, people. This is genius. So here's my hint for you. The next time you guys see me, which should be Wednesday, ask me to tell you, just like this, the Taco Bell story. Ask you about my college class in Taco Bell, and I will tell you a story. All right, we're going to try to finish this up. Large factories required startup capital. Capital, I, I keep thinking this is an economics class. This is AP World History. Capital is money. And I, did I give you the example about someone who started a McDonald's? Somebody comes in and they puts up the money. You know, poor people don't really have enough money to put up. Eventually, they're going to invent this thing called the corporation in which you can buy stock. And so if you want to buy stock in a company and you can get stock as cheap as $50, what you basically do when you buy stock in a company, you're giving them money. You're like, okay, I'm going to give you $50 and I'm going to buy a little bitty piece of ownership in your company. I want you to become such a good company that my $50 stock is worth $400. Uh, corporations form to share risk. So what happens is you have a bunch of investors rather than have one guy own the whole company. And if the company goes under, it goes bankrupt. He loses all his money, he or she. You have 500 people buy stock. And so instead of one person putting up $50 million for a company, you can have 50, million, 50 people putting in $1 million. So you have 50 owners of the company, but if the company goes under, they've only lost $1 million. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a million dollars, but there's lots of people out there who do. And so you are sharing the risk and you're maximizing the profits. Uh, and Britain and France are the countries that found it, laid the foundations for the modern corporation. Uh, all right, moving on. This is going to be our last slide. Uh, large uh, corporations form blocks to drive out the competition. There's a famous man in American history named John D. Rockefeller. He controlled, he, what he did was he would take over every part of the oil industry. Let's say you had the oil well, and then you had the oil refinery and the gas station. He bought them all. Understand? Uh, nowadays, it's illegal to do that in this country. It, like, for instance, we have a bunch of hamburger chains right now, right? You see the word Monopoly? Some of you played the game Monopoly. I got that new, have, have you seen the new version of Monopoly that has, it's called a Popkaopoly? I got that for Christmas. We haven't played it yet. It's, it's the Monopoly game with the Popka names in it. In the game Monopoly, your goal is to control everything. That's how you win the game. In this country, because we're a capitalist country, let's say that Burger King had a lot of money and they bought Wendy's. Would the government allow it? Maybe. But then they bought McDonald's. And then they tried to buy Hardee's. And then they tried to buy, I don't know who else makes hamburgers. Um, I started to say, you know, Chick-fil-A, but that's a chicken place. So is Zaxby's. If Burger King bought all of the major hamburger manufacturers, what could they do with the price? Raise it. And that would be a monopoly. And so now Burger King cannot buy McDonald's unless they go to the U.S. government and get approval. And the U.S. government, considering that's the two biggest hamburger manufacturers and Wendy's in the world, they are probably not going to let them do that. Anyway, my point is John D. Rockefeller bought all these different parts of the oil refining business. All right. And so governments were slow. Nowadays, they're not. They are not slow, but back then they were slow. Okay, and so at this point, this is our second video, uh, and I'm going to stop.